We will move on to the second speaker now, uh, who is Mark Köckelberg, Professor of Media and Technology at the Department of Philosophy of the uh, Vienna University. And uh, Mark Köckelberg will be talking about the problem of AI and climate change on the nexus of the technology, technological and the living. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Good afternoon. Um, yes, so um, I thought for this conference, uh, which is so much about this convergence technological living, I choose two teams that I'm interested in. Um, and one is uh, the theme of how can we, within practical ethics, uh, try to bring together thinking about environment and thinking about um, uh, more the technological ethics. So this is one uh, theme what I want to discuss, and then I want to give a practical example um, of how to bring these two together, namely thinking about AI and climate. Um, so first, of how to bring together environmental and technology ethics. So I, first, I would like to context contextualize this question. So um, there's a kind of sense of crisis we have today, environmental crisis, but also technological, political, um, there's wars and so on. So we have this crisis situation. And environment is really part of this, um, this whole. And one uh, particular way of um, thinking about this is to um, talk about Anthropocene and talking about modernity. Um, so that's my first point. Uh, so Anthropocene is um, yeah, about our, uh, for me it's about our modern desire to control everything and humanity becomes a kind of hyper agency uh, that, that controls the earth. So it's a planetary condition um, where yeah, humanity itself has become a geological force. And I find it interesting to talk about AI and environment within that context, because then you see AI can be understood as increasing this hyper agency, increasing the control, increasing humanity's grip on the earth. And um, since climate change induced by humans, among other things, can be seen as, um, yeah, uh, climate change can be seen as, as also a problem that's related to this anthropocenic condition. It's related to this hyper-agency. Um, also, the uh, specific view on technology, that technology is a solution for everything and that other solutions are, uh, are, are not really there. We always look at technology first. So how can we get beyond that? How, um, how can we get a different relation to nature is in itself a very central question, I think, also for philosophy of technology. And then I'm very interested in exploring non-modern ways of thinking. And that can be um, an interesting route there is to learn from people who are grounded in um, anthropology, cultural anthropology, because they study non-modern um, indigenous cultures, or they studied uh, even like uh, Bruno Latour, the, the scientific cultures, but from the point of view of looking um, through, through the same lens as uh, anthropologists. And I think from these people, also Tim Ingold, who I invited for later uh, in, in November, um, we can learn how non-modern thinking works, um, but it's very difficult. But what the purpose of, of this is, is to um, bring together the uh, natural and the technological the natural and the, the uh, human also. Um, so that, that's, that's one direction. Another direction is critical post-humanism, who also think about um, Haraway and, and contemporary writers who think about the, the figure of the cyborg, which combines the biological and the technological again. So I find all these non-modern ways of thinking <laughs> interesting, because there we, we see how to bring together um, these two spheres. Now, within uh, the academic world, there is still this, this gap between environmental ethics and technology ethics. This is also a reason why I set up a new center in Prague for that, uh, next to my work here. 
And um, what I try to do is to connect research on, in these two fields. Um, so some teams can be about, um, of course, the impact on technology on the environment, but also m more philosophical thinking about how our relation, how to conceptualize our relation to nature, how to evaluate that relation, um, and relational ways of thinking themselves can be interesting there. Um, also, of course, thinking about responsibility, and then making the, the loop back to also uh, very concrete technology development, like what does this mean uh, for, for technology development. Um, some themes that, that could be interesting there is, of course, a link with in, uh, responsible innovation then, but also governance to bring together digital and environmental, also within a European context and a global context. Um, animal ethics and technology is an interesting team. I already mentioned Anthropocene, and I'm currently uh, interested in climate change and AI. So, and within that, I like to, um, so these are some, some work where, where I already look at this link between environment and technology, um, but currently I'm mainly interested in the political um, side of that. And so one can ask the question like, how, what is the relation between AI and climate, and what does this mean then for the ethics and politics of climate change? So that's now the, the uh, second part of my talk, um, like how can we use AI for climate change? Well, AI can be, of course, part of the solution to climate change um, in the sense that it can do all kind of all these things, right? So it can gather and process data on temperature change, help to predict weather events um, and show their effects, um, help manage energy consumption. Um, we can also process data on endangered species. So generally for environmental purposes, it's, um, it's great to use AI also. Um, transforming transportation in a way that leads to less emissions. Uh, we can track deforestation, monitor oceans, uh, and so on and so on. Now, what I'm especially interested in is a question like, what can we do with humans? Because it seems that uh, it's very difficult to um, change our behavior in a more environmentally friendly and indeed climate friendly direction. So how can we do that? And there I find that um, political philosophy is very helpful. So one, um, so now we look more at how AI can also be part of the problem and what, uh, what can do with human behavior, uh, which raises political questions. So first of all, um, of course, AI has some ethical problems. I will not go into that here. Um, there's also many questions about regulation. But um, it's, it's good to know that AI can also be a problem for climate. So uh, the electricity used by data centers, for example, the, the, tech in, uh, the oil industry who, who uses AI. And more generally, so it's about the data processing and storage that uses energy and creates carbon emissions. Um, it's also about the production of electronic devices that requires energy and natural resources. And then, yeah, there's generally an, a lack of awareness um, because when we use our electronic devices, they are made in such a way that they seem very clean. They seem like not like the technologies of the industrial revolution, but they, they, they seem not to pollute. They seem to be uh, sleek and, and clean. So that's a problem. So there needs to be more awareness about this problem. I also think that if we then want to evaluate this, we need ethics, but we also need uh, a political philosophy of AI. And here I come back to what I said about what about the humans, because it is true that many of us um, behave in ways that are not climate friendly. So how can we change that? And what does it mean for governance of AI and indeed governance of individual behavior? Now, one, one uh, way to approach this is to tell people what to do and to force people what to do. This is partly done by the laws we have in our society anyway, so it's partly accepted. But it's, of course, always a violation of the principle of freedom, so it needs to be always justified, and it's very controversial. Um, for that reason, uh, some people have proposed in, in political theory and, um, and governance the, the concept of nudging, and nudging is about, um, for example, in a supermarket, putting some things uh, closer to your um, uh, to your eye, to where you where you walk, to the to the checkout, for example, 
uh, so that you see them and are maybe more inclined to buy them. So after Sarah's talk, we are again in the supermarket. Um, yeah, and the idea is that, that this uh, uh, preserves freedom uh, because there's no coercion. So you don't force people to buy the right things that are climate friendly, for example, but you, you um, change what the, uh, the people from nudging theory call the choice architecture. You, you gently nudge them into that direction. Now, this influencing of human behavior is, uh, is not about influencing people by arguing. It's not using reason. It's instead working on, on a decision system that is not explicit, that is not using reasons. And this is problematic because it does not respect our autonomous, rational um, decision-making capacities, which we also have as humans. Um, so this is a difficult issue because, um, yeah, first of all, it is already happening, but that is, of course, not a reason to, to um, want it or approve uh, of it. But, of course, nudging could be used for good purposes, so we could try to um, influence people's behavior in, in a more environmentally and climate-friendly direction, as uh, governments, as um, anyone busy with governance, but we could yeah, also see how problematic that is in a liberal democracy, where, because it's a form of covert manipulation of citizens' choices. And so I think for um, governmental decision-making and uh, questions about policy, this will be more and more um, an, uh, an issue to consider. Um, also at the global level, and because the problem is that um, yeah, climate change is a global problem, so we can, in Austria and Europe, we can have um, great climate-friendly policies, but what about other countries? And shouldn't a global problem be met by a global solution? Now, this is again something that um, in political philosophy is, um, is something that needs to be discussed because what does, it, what does global governance mean? Um, if you agree we need more coordination at the planetary level, then how to do that, how to organize that? Can we organize it in a democratic way? And um, yeah, what if that would mean again to um, uh, threaten freedom, first of all, by laws that involve coercion, but also perhaps by nudging uh, on a global scale. So I think it's important to have this kind of political discussions about power, about um, author authority also, and, and about what, how much freedom do we want to give up to indeed um, deal with climate change. Another uh, important issue from political philosophy is, is the concept of justice. Um, so the one problem with climate change is that not everyone is equally vulnerable to climate change on this planet. Uh, for example, people in the Pacific Island, uh, Islands that could, be, could have problems or people in, living in region, regions with long droughts. Um, and so if that's the case, then um, what kind of policies do we need? Can we have policies that help more people that, that are more vulnerable? Or is it going to benefit mainly people living in the West and not in the global South? And already in 2010, there is a COMAST report that says that, yeah, um, that this um, uh, failure to respond to climate change will render even more vulnerable those people who already found themselves in, in, a, in a vulnerable position, um, not only in terms of environmental uh, situation, but also in political and in ideological struggles. So the danger is that if we um, don't do anything or if we only do something that benefits the North, then uh, this, could, um, this could be the result. So what does this mean? I think that we need to look at uh, the political effects and discuss them in terms of the principles that we think are important. Um, and uh, yeah, we need to discuss concrete measures for doing something about climate change and their political impact. Nudging was an example. We can also talk about geoengineering, for example, and, and whom it would benefit, who would pay for it, um, and how the effects would be distributed. Um, one can also live in terms of behavior, like who should change lifestyle in order to save whom, right? So, so who is going to be the people who benefit from that? And are people, for example, in the West, are they um, 
uh, willing to uh, be in solidarity with people who suffer from climate change. Um, and again, this kind of questions will also come up uh, with, for example, nudging. So who bears the cost in terms of freedom um, and, and who will, will benefit? There's also a question when it comes to climate change about urgency and priority. So if people are in situations of war, if people are in situations of poverty, lack of clean water and so on, um, the question is how to, for, for policy, how to prioritize. And, um, so that's always a political question. What, what is the priority? Um, and yeah, there um, it's important for me to see, have not just technocratic solutions, but have discussions about these political values, about the priorities, also global priorities, um, and to take into account this um, yeah, objection that could come from the global south, saying like, well, you're, you're worried about AI, you're worried about climate change, but isn't this, um, uh, when we talk about the global level, an attempt of control, neocolonialism, and so on. So I think this kind of discussions we will need to have um, when it comes to dealing with climate change and uh, when it comes to, to yeah, making also policy, uh, global AI policy that um, responds to climate change in a way that does respect freedom, that does respect also uh, global and intergenerational justice. Thank you.